Hey, good morning, everybody. How are we? Good. And I just want to uh, doubly endorse Pastor Robin and Heather and uh, just tell you that the church they pastor is an amazing church and uh, God's really moving there. They've raised up teams of young leaders and there's so much enthusiasm there and incredible worship. And Rob would probably never say this, but even on Spotify, their worship album, I think one of their songs has had four million listens which is about 4 million more than the listens I've had on Spotify, so, <laughs> so it's amazing. And, 3 million 999 were me. <laughs> take, take, no, not really. Yeah, but they're amazing people, and, uh, and Pastor Will, so are you, mate. I've just been watching you lead the church this morning and lead yeah. the worship, and I just want to say I love you and your wife, and you're just doing an amazing yeah. thing here. Can you give your pastors a big hand, everybody? Yeah, amen. Excellent. So here we are with Pastor Rob, who's just got back from the Ukraine. And uh, so I just want to ask him a series of questions about that. And I think, firstly, Rob, most of us here haven't been to the Ukraine. No. So tell us, what is the Ukraine like? Um, it's not a place I'd choose to go on holiday. It, I'm not talking about the war. It's not the most picturesque place that I've been to in the world. I have found, actually, I never had a heart for India. I never wanted to go to India. And um, we've ended up ministering in India every year. Um, and I never had a heart for the Ukraine. But we, I went there um, physically in the West where I went. Um, it's untouched by war. Um, but it's very, I don't know how else to say, but middle, uh, middle European, which is... I, it's just hard to describe. It's lots of very brightly coloured houses in a very middle um, European style. Um, the people have a certain look, if I can put it that way. Um, you just know that you're not in Australia. You're not in Kabulcha, <laughs> definitely, when you're there. Fair enough. And what's the food like? Rob's a great foodie. What's the food like in the Ukraine? Yeah, so uh, the food is solid. Um, it's lots of soups and noodles and stuff like that, and lots of bread. A man alive, they give you a lot of bread. And, uh, but very, very good, wholesome food. Yeah, I, I, um, I certainly put on weight. While I was over there, actually, a, a rather interesting thing happened was, I was when I was in the Ukraine for two days, I um, was being shown around all these different areas that had needs, monetary needs, prayer needs, and so on. And we stopped there for, for like lunch. They go, oh, we'll have lunch, which was at 10 a.m. And um, that's the first house we stopped. So I filled up on this soup and bread. I went, yeah. And then half an hour later, we got to another place and they said, oh, let's do lunch. And so we did it again. I was like, oh, well, that's good. The third place, this is like a half hour after each one. By that point, I was like, I can't eat anymore. So I said, no, that was a big mistake. Because what happened was they then fill your plate up for you. And so, because their hospitality is food. So I was like, we had six lunches. <laughs> in four hours and I was feeling vi I, w I thought I cannot be violently ill this is this is just not good so I learned you know fill up your own plate and eat a little bit but um no the food was great I'm, I'm a bit adventurous when it comes to food so I didn't mind it at all and Rob's a former chef as well so did you eat anything really bizarre over there really strange that you'd never normally eat? yeah I did we had um this uh, well in Slovakia because I went to Slovakia and then over the border into Ukraine friends there made this uh like a Past. Well, it's actually like they just got it like macaroni cheese. Uh, it was grayish in color, and it was like a melted down gnocchi um, in, with cheese. And the cheese was like I think from sheep or goats or some animal, and it made your mouth really tingle, um, and like it was like anesthetized. But it wasn't that that was the interesting thing. The interesting thing was that they put these three bottles in front of me. They all looked so very excited. I said, "This is what we traditionally drink with this with this meal." The first one was sheep's milk. The second one was sheep's milk, uh, f fermented sheep's milk. The third one was curdled sheep's milk. So it was, the fluid was yellow, and it was like coils of goop. And Gabby, my daughter, and I have this, um, this thing that when we go away, uh, we will always try, so we will try the most disgusting thing we can find. I mean, we didn't say that to people, it was disgusting. <laughs> but we will try the most adventurous thing, let's put it that way. So I tried the curdled and, and um, with clots in it and I fortunately it tasted all right it was slightly sweet um it was the texture it was like it was very street it was like swallowing rubber band I don't know what to describe it like but it was yeah like whole spaghetti or I don't know it was gloopy I can't even drink that bubble tea I hate it I don't like the ugh. I don't I'm a texture person anyway I drank, drank that actually tasted pretty good so that was the most adventurous Sounds very adventurous. So um, obviously there's a war going on there, Rob. We watch yep. it on TV and we see glimpses. How, from your observation, is the war affecting the Ukraine today? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I, I don't profess to be an expert on, on the Ukraine, but having gone there, you, obviously you start to take a lot more notice about what's happening. And I think what's very evident is that you've got a guy, so you've got Putin, will say to be charitable, he is a channel for evil in this, in this situation. I was reading this morning actually in Luke 14 about uh, how the Lord commands us to pray for even the most evilest of people, that their hearts can be touched. And I think we forget that. We just categorize and go evil, you know, but get him wiped out. But actually he needs to be touched by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit can do that. But what has happened is that, that release of evil, actually we don't realize that it releases not lesser evils, but it's actually a conduit for all evil to break out. So what's happening in the Ukraine, I mean, obviously you're having built, you're having whole, the whole country is being wiped out systematically by missiles and so on. I think two weeks ago, there was $60 billion worth of infrastructure. How do you come back from that? But, but that's on a physical level. You're seeing families wiped out by missiles. You're seeing, you know, we're now hearing about the mass graves. We're hearing all, sort, all this sort of stuff. Um, but on a, not even just a spiritual level, but on a natural level, people don't realize that in a war, um, it's not just a war um, that it's against the end. There's all sorts of stuff going on beneath the surface. So sex trafficking has gone through the roof. The hotel I stayed in in Slovakia, which is a, a safe country, there were two incidences of sex trafficking while I was there. Women who had been uh, promised help to go to Norway and to go to Switzerland from the Ukraine were being sex trafficked. Police were involved. I didn't, wasn't involved there, but I was told that by the owner. You've got child trafficking on the rise. Um, you've got um, rape, rape of men and women by Russian soldiers, and probably, very honestly, by Ukraine soldiers. And this is the thing: it's not, it's humanity. Um, we don't excuse it, but we need to realise that it's much bigger than just can we help feed people. Um, it's actually to do with God needs to move in the Ukraine. And I do believe that it's right for a move of the Holy Spirit, for a move of God there. Otherwise, all we're doing, I, I mean, I still, I still say, hey, let's still help them out. But I do believe that um, God is wanting to move in the Ukraine in a powerful way. So uh, on, a, on, a, on a war level, you know, obviously in the east, he's, uh, Putin is beginning to take land, but the Ukrainians are heading back. Um, I, was, uh, I asked some Ukrainians who were staying in the hotel, and, and the, this is so interesting. What they were doing was, you know, uh, they're not believers, but they were actually buying up a ute to, to take back to the Ukraine to put a missile launcher on it. These, these are people who were, three weeks ago, when I met them, were managers in insurance companies, were um, teachers, professors. So, you know, this, they're fighting for their lives, fighting for their country. And... Um, yeah, so there's so many things that are going on um, at a level that we, we can't even really understand. What really hit me, Andrew, was the fact that these are people who are plugging in their iPhones, have Wi-Fi, watch Netflix, go to the movies, shop in shopping malls. This is not, and again, I forgive the analogy, because we, it, but I'm sure you'll understand in this concept, we're not talking about an African war of poverty, and this is actually people like you and me, mm. who take pride in their appearance, buy nice clothes, like the things that you like, want what you want. This is not, this is not some poor little country. So it's, it's really, really confronting when you face that, and you meet people that have run from their life. Think about your home in Kabulch or wherever you live, Bribe, your beautiful home and having to walk away from it because somebody has decided that they want your land and they're just going to, they're going to take it, whatever it, whatever it means. It's just incredible. And it should confront us as believers to actually be on our knees, not just go, oh, bless the Ukraine. No, actually, we need to pray against sex trafficking. We need to pray against uh, that we need to pray for Putin, for a, a heart, his heart to be touched by the Holy Spirit. We need to pray for the, the leadership of the Ukraine. The Ukraine president, and I'm rambling a bit, and I'll let you ask your questions in a minute. I tend to hijack the interview, but I don't really mean to. But Pre Zelensky, the president, I, was, I asked this couple who were buying the missile launcher. They said, 
How, I said, what do you think of Zelensky? They said, well, when, when he came into power, we thought he was a joke, because you know he's the next comedian. Um, we thought he was a joke, but actually something has changed about him and he has led our, our country so well in this, um, in this season. So there is a lot of love and support for him. He's not getting everything right, but actually they are amazed how he has risen um, to And I do believe, you know, there's a difference. What we need to understand is a difference between uh, a man... Uh, of God and God's man. Now, he might not be a man of God in the sense of having a salvation experience, but he is God's man. And we can pray that, it, that for him, because I believe God has risen him up in this situation, we can pray for him and for salvation and for the Ukraine mm. and for God's will to be done through him. I believe we, that's how, what we're in, we are um, commanded to do. Mm. Amazing. So sad. And you mentioned Slovakia, so obviously the, the nations around the Ukraine are being affected by this mm. conflict as well. So how are those nations being affected? Yes, yeah, so in the west of Ukraine and then Slovakia, yeah, there is an unease uh, in the Ukraine, west of Ukraine definitely because their country is at war, but you can feel an unease everywhere you go. In, in Slovakia, they're pretty much the same, is that feeling of Putin might not stop there. Uh, he might come and and they were under communism for um, 40 years. Heather and I actually went to Slovakia when it, communism fell in the 90s, and that's how we met this pastor that um, I, I've hooked up, back, we've hooked up again with. Um, so they've known what it is to be oppressed. So this might not be communism, but it's actually just a, it's the same spirit in a different name, um, where it's oppression and it's, you just wipe out free, free thought, free speech, and so on. So there is great unease at what's, um, what's happening. And then they've also just been, excuse me, through themselves in Slovakia, the whole thing of COVID. Um, it split the church dramatically, the LGBTQ, um, all around that has split the church dramatically. Um, so, um, yeah, they, they are going through in many ways what we've all gone through and are going through. Um, but, yeah, they, but the church, what I would say is the church is shining in Slovakia and shining in the Ukraine. Mm. Awesome. And uh, I believe your church is doing something on the power of one at the moment. And so, Rob, I love the fact that a guy from Kabulcha ended up in this war zone. <laughs> and um, that's the bloke from Kabulcha. So can you tell us how did God call you to go to the Ukraine? Yeah, uh, when um, Pastor Will told me about the power of one, like your vision focus for this year, um, something leapt in me because I realized it tied in very much with the story because... What happened was um, about, uh, uh, so March the, March the 29th I went, so about a week before, it was about the 22nd of March, um, uh, Heather and I decided that week we would go back to the gym. We hadn't been to the gym for about six months. In fact, we hadn't really committed in the full year that we'd signed up for it. I just say, so that was the highlight of the week, going back to the gym, like that was enough. Went back to the gym. I was sitting there doing, I can't even remember, probably on my I was on my phone because the, the BBC app sent through this notification. And I looked down and it was about the Ukraine and I felt emotional about it. And then I just felt the Holy Spirit say to me, and this is probably one of two or three times, two or three times in my life where I've act, not heard a, a, an audible voice, but absolutely apprehended by the Holy Spirit. And he said, you can be sad, you can be mad, you can pray, you can send money, but I want you to go. Wow. And I think this ties in so much about the power of one, because what we think of as powerful and these great men of God and women of God in the Bible is, but actually, God needs to be able to interrupt our lives. Right. And we need to live lives that are interruptible. And the problem is our society sets us up where it's not interruptible. We love being interrupted by our phone and our mates and our this and our social lives. But actually being interrupted by God, something inside me, and I could get very preachy and I don't mean to get preachy, but I could, something has to change in all of us, in all of our churches, something has to change because we are not interruptible. We're actually very much stuck in our ways and we, of course, we've got to live our lives and go with the vision that God has put, but there's something about where God says something. So, again, what happened was, he said, you, so I went, and there, there wasn't really any argument, but the only thing that I thought was, well, how's this going to happen? 
How do you go to the Ukraine and serve refugees? What does that even mean? So, um, but within me, I went, no, this is how I knew within that minute it was, it was on. So I was then going to, it was a Tuesday, so I went to the church office and I was um, starting to prepare my message for Sunday. And, um, but I was also praying about this call and I'm like, what's going on, you know? So I set, flicked off an email I Googled, I flicked up an email to a Polish refugee center and a Czech Republic refugee center and didn't hear back from them. And then I was praying a bit more and thinking about it. And then my friend's face off Facebook popped up. And what? Um, and it's a lady, a pastor that we knew in the 90s when we went to Slovakia, met them. We'd been friends on Facebook again, but actually didn't know much about each other's lives. And her face came up and I thought, I'll ask Hanka, so, because these guys are in Slovakia, so maybe their denomination is doing something with the Ukraine refugees. So I flicked off an email and I said, uh, 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 a um, message, and I just said, hey, um, I'm just feeling a God that I should come over and help the refugees. I'm a chef by trade, um, I'm a pastor, I've got a, a, a diploma in counseling, so, you know, maybe these things could be used. She texted back almost straight away and just said, hey, this sounds like God, let's pray about what it means. Um, we, we're really excited. When she did that, something again came alive in me. So I flicked back a thing and just said, hey, I really, really, really believe this is God. Well, then she, that was their night time, so she went to bed. Spent the day um, at church doing my thing, and then I went home to Heather and Gabby, and they, we were having dinner, and I said, um, I may have volunteered to go to the Ukraine. Um, and you know how it is telling your wife or, you know, like... <laughs> um, and Heather said... To, Heather's response wasn't what I thought it would be. Heather's not a fearful person, but she is kind of like, have you thought this through? Do you know what you're doing? You know, like, of course you should do all of that. It's great to have a wife that's like that. But she didn't say that. She said... What did you say? Yeah. Oh, you're not going to Macedonia. I was like, what? And she said, Macedonia, remember? And I said, nope. Now, Heather's got this gift. She can remember every prophetic word we've ever had. She can remember where we were, and she can remember what people were wearing. And she can just recite these prophetic words from 40 years ago. So I said, well, what are you talking about? She said, the Macedonia, we had this, we had this prophetic word. And obviously, I want to tie that into what Pastor Will was saying this morning, because it talks about the Mas Macedonia um, in, in um, what, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. And um, anyway, so I said, well, what are you talking about? She said, so we, before we went to China, so Heather and I went to China for two years to, to teach English. We'd left a church situation. We were in a new season of our lives. And these past, went to a pastor's conference, and one of the pastors prophesied and said, every new season in your life is going to be marked by a Macedonia call. And it will be um, that people saying, come and help us, come over here and help us. And um, so for those of you who might not know, but in Acts, I should have, I meant to look up the chapter. Every time I've meant to look up the chapter. But Paul has a dream and he sees a man praying, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And he does that. So I went, that was another like confirmation. But then we went, we immediately went to the message um, and read the scripture. And in the message, it says, come over to Europe and help us. Mm. So we were like, whoa, this is getting a bit sort of goosebumpy and tingly. And then within the hour, Hanker, the pastor's, pastor and his wife, had sent back a thing saying, we believe this is God. We were only praying yesterday for somebody to come over and help us. Hmm. So even now my, I'm going, whew. Um, it was that clear, clearer word. Wow. And what I want to say about that is, especially speaking into the power of one, I mean, I'm sure we'll and your team are taking you through that, what that means. What I think is really important is when I was 13, I, got a, I knew, I became a Christian and I knew God had called me to Australia. Mm. And I, lived in, I was living in England. It took 10 years for that to happen. Mm. We like to be interrupted by God, but actually what we need to do is interrupt him and remind him of his promises to us. So we need to be interruptible. But actually, he's waiting for us to interrupt. Think about in Luke, it talks about how the guy went to God, uh, the, sorry, the God, went to the man and he said, he interrupted him at night. He kept hammering on the door and said, I've got a friend coming and I need provision for him. Would you please give it to him? He didn't open up. He did, and in the end, because the man wore him down, it says, 
he opened up the door and gave him the bread that he needed to feed his visitor. I believe sometimes we don't like that image of God as somebody we have to keep, but actually, sometimes we need to keep interrupting him. So for 10 years of my life, I interrupted God. I would go, you promised that I was going to Australia. I believe your word, make it happen. And it didn't happen for 10 years, and then within one year it opened up, happened. I moved to Australia, met Heather, got married, and then we moved back to England um, with a, with a word that God gave us, and then we moved, we adopted Fred, our son, and we moved back to Australia. Then we went to China based on a word of God, but all of these things are based on being interruptible. Right. And so it's really important, because what's important about that is it's the power of one. Because I, if I hadn't, and I know I'm talking about myself, but I know you'll understand what I'm saying. If I, at age 13, hadn't actually obeyed the call and kept interrupting God and saying, you need to make this happen. You need to make this happen. You need to make this happen. I would not be leading Kingdom Culture Church because I wouldn't have aligned myself and set myself up for what was next. The issue is that we think the, the, the call of one or the, the power of one is about us. It's not about us at all. It's actually about the different layers, how it affects everybody in your world and you set them up because often we go, oh, I'm not going to... Uh, I, I'm not going to be, an, oh, like this word, I'm not going to be an armor bearer. Yeah, thanks very much, Pastor Rob, for saying that. I'm not going to be, but actually you don't realize that you're not setting yourself up. You're not setting a whole host of other people up yeah, yeah. and setting them up for a win. So these, these things are really, really, really mm. important. Mm. So have I finished my story about going over? Yes, I did. Um, we, we went over to the Ukraine based, really based, on, and within six days I was on the plane um, going to Ukraine. Wow, amazing. So when you got to the Ukraine, Pastor Rob, how did God use you there? What did you see God do there? That's a good... Um, so what happened was I had no intention of raising money. I thought I'll go and cook for the refugees because I can cook. I thought I can obviously pray for people, I can counsel and blah, blah, blah. Then I can't even remember how it happened really yet. Oh, yes, we had a Zoom prayer meeting. with. We're part of Full Gospel Churches of Australia. So there's about 200 churches around Australia. We have a Zoom pastor's prayer meeting from, from pastors all around Australia. We started talking. Uh, I said, I'm going off to Ukraine. They said, well, you know, let's, some of them said, let's raise some money. So I thought, what a great idea. Let's raise some money. So um, within two weeks of that initial let's raise some money, $55,000 was raised. And I want to thank um, Pastor Will um, and, and this amazing church because you contributed to that. And honestly, I know what it's like when you're giving to something. It can feel a little bit like, yeah, that's really good. But I, hopefully these stories that we talk about in the next will make you realize what you've done. Um, and so went over there. Um, and like I say, um, went into the Ukraine for the first, for two days. I was, I went to a, a, a cancer hospital for kids um, and what is so interesting is that even in peacetime the Ukraine actually only provides doctors and nurses for their hospitals um, they don't actually provide the funds to run them or the equipment they, they're solely reliant on donations and outside funding um, I went to a children's I went to saw a, all these babies in a ward that had just been abandoned and war doesn't change people's, the things that happen. The kids are still get abandoned and, you know, so there's just, I went to a woman's home whose son had just been diagnosed with cerebral palsy. She just set up treatment for him to, to help. And it's really important that two years old, they get that treatment with that, with that particular affliction. Um, all gone because they, she was going over to the east of Ukraine to get that happening and the, the hospital's bombed, everything's gone. Um, so you see hope, you see despair in people's lives because they, you know, it has this incredible effect. Uh, met with a woman who has cancer. She too was just about to get her cancer treatment, but it was in a, I think it was in Kiev, and that hospital's gone. She got, obviously can't travel there. So all these things are happening. Um, we saw uh, an orphan went to an orphanage um, that um, their, their, you know, all that gets affected. I went to uh, churches. Um, a church called uh, the Utskarod Baptist Church, and they are um, housing 
about 80 refugees a day and feeding them. So just think about your church, this church here. This auditorium at night time would be wall-to-wall beds. Um, and, and they're doing it with such a grace. Then you've got to feed them, and they're feeding them. I don't know about your finances. I know about our finances as a church. We would probably be finished in two months if we had to pay for their food bill for 80 people. Um, and these churches are doing with such, such grace and love. Um, and Pastor David and Pastor Vazia, we're actually teaming up with them um, to uh, help in that area. But it's just re- re- really, really imp- important to understand that it's not just about making a difference. I actually do believe um, our churches, and again, I'm careful to talk about you guys, but the ones that are really, and, and like I say, thank you again for getting behind, it's actually really important to realise that it, we're not just called to pray. And I love prayer. I believe in the power of prayer moves mountains, absolutely. But actually, what G, if you remember, a lot of the, the parables were things like sow a mustard seed. So a mustard seed for you might be a big thing. So it might be five bucks a month that you give to, to I've forgotten the name of your, the care, what was the? Uh, global, care. global care. It might be that you give to that. But just commit to it. Be a person of your word. This is what's really important. We've been teaching our church, be people of your word. Because honestly, Christians are the most dodgiest people at times. We mean well, but we don't count the cost. If you look at the Gospels, the power of one was actually based on somebody paying a price and counting the cost and following through and being a person of their word. And what happens is we get in the moment, the excitement of the moment, we go, yes, but actually God is much more interested in the power of the follow through. And so... Um, we are, are, are joining with this church to help them. Right. And, um, so all that money you raised, Rob, in a nutshell, what oh, yes, is being Oh, yes, I didn't mention what on, I did with that. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew. This is why Andrew's interviewing me, because I, <laughs> I get excited and forget things. Yeah, so <clears throat> what was wonderful was $55,000. We were able to buy two, uh, a Mercedes van, and I can't remember what the other one was, but uh, two vans, um, you can buy for, you can get double your bucks worth over there. Secondhand cars are much better value over there. They're half the price of here. So we've got two vans. One went immediately to Pavlograd, which is in the east. It's in the war zone. And that is going to be used to um, take food uh, around. Literally, people are living in their basements. Mm. They, some of the people don't come out for three weeks at a time. Well, what they do is they actually come out of their basement they grab water from a broken pipe and they get shot at. And then they run back to their basements. The people that are leaving, this is what people don't realize, is refugee, a lot of the refugees that are leaving the East are wealthy. They can afford to get out. A lot of the others are people who have got elderly parents or people who have, with disabilities. They are living in their basements. They don't see the light of day from one end to the other. They are freezing. They are starving, um, and they are reliant on people um, in the West and their, own, their, their people supplying. So we, and then the second van uh, is staying in the West of the Ukraine, which is not being attacked at the moment, and that's being used by the Utsgara Baptist Church. So I call it UBC because it's a mouthful. UBC, and uh, they're ferrying um, refugees that come over from the east to the west, from the train stations, from wherever they arrive, and they're bringing them to the church and housing them. Some, what happens in a war situation, Andrew, is that um, it, it actually shows up the cracks in the church. Mm. And yes, the, the church absolutely shines, but it also shows up the cracks. And we need not be frightened of that, but we need to realize that actually God is, wants us to rise up, but also deal with that. And one of the things that happens is you've got churches that will not take unbelievers. So they'll take refugees, but not unbelievers. I, now, let's be honest, we go, that's terrible. But sometimes our churches can be, you know, a gay couple walk in, kick them out. 
they're not doing what we feel they should be doing. But actually, we had a couple in our church, and they stayed for about a year and a half, and then they disappeared for six months, and they come back. All they do is sit under the worship and under the word, and I think, you know what? You don't know what you're doing, but God does, because if you can sit under the word and hear the words of Jesus, if you can sit under worship, something's going to break off your lives. And we need to understand that we are actually no different. We kind of have different standards, but actually ours are just as dodgy at times. Um, so what we need to realize is um, that in, in a time of war, the cracks appear. Mm. There were, I'm not going to say what I was going to say next. That's all right. Sorry, I just realized it's not appropriate. It wasn't rude. It was just, yeah. I don't want to say it. Um, yeah, so there's lots of situations um, over there that, that, uh, that God is breathing into and, and w- with the money. Uh, and then there was also, uh, out of that 55000 was about uh, about $15,000 left. And we left that there and they then loaded up the vans with about 10 full van loads of food and medical supplies right. and, and, and stuff like that. So it is. It's very good. It's amazing. <coughs> and, um, you know, how good is it that the churches of Australia have donated yeah. their money and are being a blessing? Yeah. Uh, yeah. in that country and uh, Pastor Oz been interviewed on a couple of radio stations the last week and I believe one of them is going to air tomorrow morning on mm. 96.5 on the morning show yeah. is it Ken and Nikki? yes yeah Ken and Nikki. so if you want to have a listen that's on tomorrow morning on 96.5 and um, well done Rob well done for going there and uh, yeah let's give him a hand thank you you know we live in a we live in an era of uh, you know social media posts where people post on social media and think they've done something for the world but this is mm. a guy who just went there and was such a blessing. And I think before we close, Pastor Rob, talk to us about the spiritual significance of your trip there and also what you sense God doing there in the midst mm. of this darkness and that yeah, tragedy. Cool. What's going on there spiritually? Yeah, I, I, I'd probably divide that into two sections. I'll just quickly talk about Slovakia. Um, so when I said um, that they had prayed, the pastor and his wife had prayed for somebody to come, and literally within 12 hours, I was I said, put my hand up and said, I'm coming. I hadn't realized that um, he had been preaching the, that, that Sunday. So this was Tuesday, the Sunday before the Tuesday. Excuse me. And he'd collapsed in the pulpit uh, with a heart condition. Um, and so I was able to stand in for him and preach for a couple of Sundays, which was quite amazing. Isn't God kind? Yeah. Like, I thought, oh, I'm going for the Ukraine, which it was. But actually, it was also to help my good friends. you know. In, and they were actually... They're in the season of handing over the church and retiring. And I was able to bring some encouragement to them because um, they were pretty distressed about some things that had been happening. Um, and it was just so wonderful to actually realize, oh, this is a real God thing. This is not just something that Rob went, yeah, you know, I ate a pizza the night before and dreamt it all up and, you know, at the gym. It was sort of like, no, this is real. And... Um, so in, in Slovakia, I mentioned about the COVID and all of these things. Again, vax, anti-vax, conspiracy theories. I realize all of that's out there and so on. I think actually God is, is saying, and what he's been speaking, I was able to actually speak into it. I didn't know that I was speaking into it. I actually preached on um, forgiveness um, and um, the Good Samaritan. Um, and... Um, afterwards, what was really interesting, they, this, this is their... I don't know what... There is no circuit, it's the Circuit Bratska denomination. Um, but I would say, probably like Baptists, maybe, I don't know, but we don't have an equivalent here. But they were all wearing masks. You, in Slovakia, you're still wearing masks. Um, so you're in a church, A doesn't respond um, when you preach, so there's no response. Um, and then, and I come from a very, very loud church, like really loud. Um, and then also they had masks on so you couldn't see if they were smiling or not so it was like oh double whammy you know just like oh. but actually i felt very confident when i was preaching i really felt like the holy spirit was there mm-hmm. and we didn't have an there was no altar call afterwards like you know if you want to come up jesus touched you blah 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 nothing like that um but it really spoke to me because what happened was over the next two weeks i had a lot of people come up to me at different times and say just want you to know that your word really challenged me and I've really been praying on it and I believe God wants me to change these things in my life. Right. And I think as charismatic churches, we and there's nothing wrong with response. I believe wholeheartedly in saying amen when someone preaches and, you know, let's encourage. 
but sometimes, and our altar calls, I believe absolutely, but sometimes they can be the quick response, whereas God is looking for a heart response wow. that makes us go away and go, you know what? I'm not just going to stand at the altar and then forget about it. This needs to change my life. And so the, that was happening, which was, which was amazing. Mm. Ukraine, I would say, like I said, I do believe it's right for the gospel. Um, we, I, I, I'll just give a couple of testimonies, if that's all right, yeah. of what I saw. So what happened was we went and we got five minutes left, so I'm going to really go quick. Um, at the UBC, um, I was asked to preach. They have um, 80 refugees, um, and they are not required to come to the prayer meeting, but they often do because they're bored or they're frightened or they're scared, you know what I mean? They just So they would come along. So we got the opportunity to preach the gospel. While I was there, there was an elderly man. Um, I call him Ivan because I can't remember what his name was, but it's uh, Ivan. And I, I went up and said hello to him, and he just rattled away at me in Ukrainian, just held my hand really tight. And I knew he was saying something really amazing, but I didn't know what he was saying. But the guy, the pastor told me that he had, um, his son um, had been killed. Um, remember the Chernobyl disaster? Um, I think you might have seen that mini-series where they're scraping the um, radioactive stuff off the roof of the building. And they sent soldiers in to do that without any protection. His son was one of those, and he died a horrible death. So this guy's known tragedy, lost his only son that way. But then he was in Mariupol recently. We know, all know Mariupol, which has just been bombed off the face of the earth, basically, with his niece and nephew living with them and their two kids. Um, and they would go down to the basement every time the air raid sirens went off. He, they would go down. Um, but they were, they, this one occasion, they just said, we're not going down. We, we just can't keep going down to the basement. And he went down, but he came back up, and the whole family had been killed by a missile. He was over in the west in, at UBC, uh, it must have been in his 80s, 85, something like that. He had this Bible by him. It was like he, he was just clinging on to it. And his story was that he'd come to know Jesus through the Baptist church by coming over. Um, and he said, I've always been, what did he say? I've always been um, fascinated by Jesus, but I've never really known what to do with it. He said, and then he gave, he'd given his life to, and he said, and they gave me a Bible. And he was just so in love with his Bible. And it reminded me of when I first it got saved that sort of there was just this move around the world about people just in love with the bible wow this is amazing he had that he was standing at the front of the church singing um so to see something like that is just it it's beyond emotion it's beyond it's like wow yeah. mm. this church is making a, a difference there so incredible and just before we close pastor mm. If people want to get involved, how can we get involved in ongoing support? Because I'm guessing that this thing's not going to end today, no, is it? No. It's ongoing. Mm. So how can we get involved and continue to support what God's doing there? Yeah, I mean, obviously, everyone's an expert, especially in politics and things like that. But um, they reckon this, the war will go on for a very long time. The Ukrainian people believe that. The pastors believe that. So what we're doing is we, we've really felt like God was saying to um, help the UBC, the Utsgur Baptist Church. That literally looks like um, they have a food bill of $15,000 a month. For the, for the, which is $2.50 a head per meal, which is not a lot when you work it out. So it sounds a lot, but it's not a lot. We're, what we're doing is um, asking, we've got a connection with 200 churches, plus our church, plus different churches that have given, different individuals that are given. Um, we, we're asking churches and individuals to commit to $150 a month. That's the first thing. Um, because if we get 100 people doing that, that's the 15,000 15, taken care of. That will all that fifteen thousand we want to raise a month, send it over to them. They will administrate it. So we've got the connection with them. We know that they're honest, good people. Them, there's not a cent goes to them. It will go to that. Um, then we're saying, hey, if you can't do one hundred fifty, you know, that's, a, that's quite a chunk out of your bud, budget each month. If you could do seventy-five, if you could do ten, if you could do five, but whatever people commit to, we just ask that you let us know that you will, you will honor that pledge for 12 months we'll review it in 12 months you might want to do a one-off gift so we can leave the details of the bank account um with with uh, pastor will and he can um hand it out but the so what's important about this is yes it is feeding people but it's much bigger than that what the leaders of that church and what that church needs to do is not to be worried about raising funds for food they actually need to be ministering Jesus on the ground. Mm. There are people with PTSDs, there's rape victims, there's 
kids with terrible trauma have seen their parents killed. That people um, who are whose parents, uh, sorry, whose parent and their husbands are living in a basement over in the east, and they can't get out because they can't take the disabled parent. To, they can't move them. So there is so much stuff that this church wants to do. Um, I believe we need we have had the power as, as a Western church, that's a churches that are not facing this sort of thing, to free them up to do what they need to do well. They should not be worried about where we're gonna how we're gonna feed these people. They believe in God, they believe in him miraculously provided, but let I'm for my heart is let us be the provider. Let us be moved by the Holy Spirit. Let us be um, moved. So what we uh, just f- in finishing, we've got one second, zero seconds, minus one, minus two, is what we need to do is, um, so what I, if, if you're feeling to do that, again, don't, it's, we're not talking about spending tithes that you normally give to this church. We're talking about above and beyond. And it, it, we are able to do that. I believe if you want to do that, what I would say is if you could let um, myself know um, by um, yeah, by letting us know. I I'm, I'm, I'm prob- might not be friends with all of you on Facebook. Rob Porter, message me. Say I want to be your friend. I'll feel wonderful. And just say I want to commit to a month I, or I want a one-off or I want to commit. The reason is important because by the end of this month, beginning of June, we'd like to make our first payment towards them having, having the food. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Pastor Will. Yeah. Thank you so much. So one of the